thank you, Neha and Lavanya, for uh, inviting me for this uh, Herky conclave. For me, it is uh, really unique to be in a room with so many women. I have never been in a room where I would get a chance to really be with so many of you. Uh, before I <coughs> start my talk today, I'll just like to read my dedication. It will be interesting for you after hearing Neha what this organization is doing and what they have achieved. So I have recently published my book, Madam Sir, and this year it has been uh, also translated into Hindi. So in the dedication I wrote, to women who refuse to be fettered and who have the self-belief that they will find a path or make one. And I think all of you here who have come today believe in what I have written. Is it a fact? So I like all of you to rise and clap for yourselves and clap for all the friends together. Thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> I have uh, to talk about the four M's, the marriage, uh, mobility, uh, motherhood, and menopause. And while I talk of my own journey, I like to share these four factors also with you. So let's go back to my hometown. I was born and brought up in Patna. I was a very sheltered child. My parents were very particular. We were three sisters, and their only thought all of my growing up years was to groom me to be a good housewife, to find a good groom for me, to be a good uh, bahu in a very traditional family. That is the way I was brought up. I was brought up by my grandparents in Patna, who were very loving, uh, very caring, but they had no thoughts for a career or that a woman should uh, be doing some outdoor activity, physical activity, she should be strong. It was all about proper education, proper grooming, how did I dress, how did I talk with everybody. So it was a very, very sheltered life. I was a good student and when I completed my um, ICSE exam from the St. Joseph's Convent, it was a con uh, English medium school, uh, I did well in my exams and my parents agreed that I would go and study in Delhi. I, was got, I got admission with Lady Irwin College. I think some of you who are from Delhi would know that in those days, Lady Irwin College was considered a very prestigious place for grooming young women. So now it has changed. It has started doing so many things more. But in those days, it was supposed to be a good place for a grooming a woman and she would ultimately find a good groom if she had attended that college. Everything was done, my fees was paid, my hostel was allotted to me. The day I was supposed to leave, a day, uh, the night before, my father goes to my grandmother, my nani, my mother's mother as you know, and tells her that please explain to Manjri that I don't want her to go. I, if she goes tomorrow morning, it will be like a bidai. You know what a bidai is? When the girl leaves her home after marriage. So there are a lot of tears, etc. And he said, and my parents told me in the morning that no, we are not sending you. My father is very upset. Now let's go back to 1967. A young girl all packed up, set to go to Delhi. Friends are so excited that I'm going to study in Delhi where others were not given that chance. And then, you know, all my dreams are literally shattered that day. Shattered that I could not go to Delhi. Now I think that, okay, it was good that I didn't go to a grooming college. It was good that I didn't happen to me. So then uh, the life again, uh, uh, I'll cut short. It's uh, time is short and I don't want to bore you with whatever I have written in my book. But very soon my marriage was fixed. I was barely in uh, the first year of my college when the marriage was fixed. Uh, I was not told that uh, mm, I have a choice. My parents had selected. We met over a cup of tea in Delhi. And very soon it was announced to me that they have agreed to marry me. So that was the way it was. So my marriage took place. I didn't even understand where I was going, what I was going, who is this man is. I just marriage was fixed and I had to accept it. Very soon, let me tell you, the marriage did not work. Why it did not work? I could have no understanding of what was happening. It was all about demands and my parents not able to meet this one, that one. Though I came from a very, very good background and we had enough money in the family, but one day my father decided enough is enough and it should, I should now come back home. That is the turning point in my life. 
and I want to share with you all that life in life many things can happen to you but there is a point when you must rise up you must rise up and take the decision for yourself and not by whatever everybody is telling you so when I came back I came I had gone abroad I came back to Delhi and I straight away went and registered myself with the Rao study circle many of you may have heard of Mr. Rao he coaches for the, uh, the civil services and those days he was the best so he really put me through the rigors because I was, not I was not a woman who was preparing for the civil services all her life. It was just like turning a full 360 and coming to do something different. So it was very rigorous uh, coaching which he gave me. And I did make it to the IPS. When I made it to the IPS, my father again was very unhappy. He said, how can you ever do a police job all my life, my grandparents had sheltered me. I had never done any physical work. I had never even uh, interacted. And if I did, if I had a uh, physical training uh, class in school, my grandfather, who would have, was a doctor, would very nicely write a note that uh, she is not up to it. Please don't give her. And the nuns would agree to not put me through the physical fitness class. So that is the way I was and suddenly I qualify for the IPS and my father again is horrified. He said, how can she do a daroga's job? You know what a daroga is? A sub-inspector. So, but by then I was a very different person. I was determined that uh, nothing can stop me. And uh, that year I arrived at the academy. But my father said before going that don't stay, just come back. Academy, dekh ke wapas aajana. This is what I went with. And there was a lot of uh, tears and cheek, everybody cheek. crying that I'm going for the police job and that I'm, in, I'm determined that I will go. Let me tell you also that my father was not cheek, a bad cheek, person or a cheek. villain as I'm trying to convey. He was a very, very loving cheek, father. Cheek, cheek. The three sisters and I have a much younger brother. Cheek, cheek. He was very particular about the way we were brought up only because his concern was that we should find good grooms. That was his uh, thinking. So when I arrived at the academy, check, it was check, a check. real surprise to me. We had six women and uh, 110 men. And uh, let me tell you, I made it to the IPS in 1976. I don't know how many of you were even born at that time. And uh, if you remember Kiran Bedi, everybody knows uh, she was the first in 1972. 73, 74, 75, every year we had only one woman. And then in 76, we had six women among a group of 110. 110 men and six women. So now when I arrive at the police academy, I'm not sure whether I should stay or not, but I'm determined to stay. And then I see this uh, young, uh, another colleague of mine with two daughters. I said, if she can do the IPS training, surely I can do it also. And uh, very briefly to tell you, the IPS training was one of the toughest training for me. And for any woman, who has not had any physical training uh, background. Uh, you start the day at about 5.45, and then there is a round of uh, taking uh, six rounds of the parade ground. Then there is a parade, PT, all, and of that also of a very tough uh, order. And drill with arms, you're always carrying a firearm and doing your drills left, right, left, right. After a break of one hour for a bath and all, then you start your indoor subjects, all the law subjects, forensic medicine, forensic science so many laws in the country, investigation. And the afternoons are generally taken over by, again, firearm practice, riding, learning how to drive a car. Those days, wireless sets were very important, learning how to use a wireless set. And in the evening, you had to play these four games, which I will be horrified because I had to play hockey, football, volleyball, and basketball, only because the men under, who work under us play these games in the police lines. So I had to learn because, you know, leading the force is very important for us. So that is the way it was. Now, after completing this vigorous training, I was allotted to Bihar Kader, thinking that, oh, I'm going to my home state. But the first day when I arrive in the police in the Bihar, the DG doesn't want to see me. I, I enter his room. I uh, execute a smart salute for which I have been made to practice a hundred times literally at the academy. And when I arrive, the DG doesn't even look up to me. He's signing his files. And then he says, I don't know why they have sent you here. I'm going to ask for Kiran Bedi's file from Delhi. And then uh, we'll decide what to do. Whereas all my other five batchmates, six of us were allotted to Bihar, were given uh, their uh, 
district training, I was not allotted anything. I had to wait for another 15 days and then they put me at Patna that I should train with the senior SP. And then, you know, the struggle of doing a job in Bihar for the first eight years, it was really debilitating. Every time, you know, in the police, it's very important to do a field job. If you don't do a field job, then, you know, you do, cannot hope to rise above. You will be just uh, considered a person who knows only the desk job well, and you will be allotted some job in the headquarters or looking after some files, etc. And that is what was happening to me while all the others were doing interesting things, learning new things in the police station, handling law and order, investigation. So this is the way it continued. But I do not give up. Now I was determined to do everything. I had done the same training as the men. There is no concession for women in the training. I said if they have been given police, uh, the district and subdivision to be working in, I should also be given. And one day, yes, the DG changed. And the new DG who came, this is the way it was. Can you believe this? The new DG who came, all my student life, I had called him uncle because his daughter and I were classmates. So when I went to him and I said, sir, I have my career is going to be finished. He said, why, why, why? I said, sir, this is the way I'm being treated. So the next day itself, I was posted to the Danapur police station, and Danapur subdivision. If anybody is from Bihar, yesterday I met a lot of people from Bihar. So I was posted to Danapur subdivision. The day I arrived <coughs> to take charge, at 12 o'clock, a message comes that there has been a murder. And then a few, that day, the, the officer in charge tells me, Madam, you have salami diye hai. Meaning that in the police, the day you arrive at the station, if there is a major crime, it means that you are being welcomed. This is the interpretation I get there. So then this happens another 15 days, and uh, a bus dacoity takes place where a man has been killed in the bus. And they, the bus dacoities had just started. In those days, we didn't have a Naxal problem or the terrorist problem and all. We had these kind of problems which seem so simple now. They seem so um, uh, small and uh, petty, these kind of crime which we handled initially. So <clears throat> when uh, now you talk about uh, your careers, etc., you have arrived in a subdivision. Now what happens? Who are your stakeholders? Your subordinates who are all looking at you, they have never ever seen a woman in a uniform, in a pant and shirt, and that also khaki. Go back to 1976 and 77, where you didn't have constables, lady constables, you didn't have lady sub-inspectors, you didn't have DYSPs and all going around, you didn't have PCR cars or uh, mobile patrols, etc., having women inside. People had not ever seen, and that too in Bihar, they had never seen a woman wearing a pant and shirt, that also a khaki. And then to lead a men, to lead the men and make them do your work, plus the uh, by uh, the um, senior ranks all looking at me for directions, my peers questioning why I have been posted to the subdivision, and the bosses all watching for me to make a mistake so that they can prove to the DG that why you have posted it. And the local MLA said that, uh, I still remember his name, Kanhai Singh, he was a very, very tough uh, MLA. He was very upset with my posting. He told the DG very frankly that I did not want a woman. What have you done? Let, let me just cut short and just tell you that the first uh, murder case itself established my identity. Because when I went there, in this, uh, he was lying, this man had been murdered, he was a farmer, lying in the uh, wheat field with uh, <clears throat> his hands and everything all splayed. Uh, his uh, throat had been cut and there were all kinds of things which had happened to him. There was a footprint, footprint in the mud there, in the ground there. So I told them, the, my subordinates who were with me, that we must lift this footprint because this is of an accused person, whoever has killed him. All of them were watching me, you know, lifting that footprint. Everybody surrounding me and watching what I'm doing. They must have thought that I'm some curiosity. So then this footprint was lifted. We solved that murder case. And this bus dacoity also, by the grace of God, I think, we were able to solve and catch the culprits along with the firearm, etc., who happened to be from a nearby village. Now, this established my identity there in the subdivision, and very soon, the atmosphere changed. People started accepting. So I always feel that knowledge is power. 
and that message I want to give to everybody, that in whatever job you do, you must know your job very well. If you do not know the rules of the job, it is very difficult to move ahead. So much so that when I was transferred out of the subdivision, the, the senior SP who was also very hostile to me called me and he said, he said that uh, Kanhai Singh had gone to the DG and said that uh, henceforth only women must be posted under my subdivision. So <clears throat> many of these incidents I have recorded in my book, so I don't want to elaborate. There were so many other cases which happened and people's confidence grow. People realized that, yes, she knows her job. The sub subordinates started respecting me. But <clears throat> it was a struggle in Bihar to get a field posting. After a lot of problems, I was given a district charge. I was posted to Bukaro Steel City. Yesterday, I met somebody from Dhanbad. That is the really the coal belt and the steel industry place. Unions and uh, uh, crime and all kinds of crime happening there. So I had a very successful stint for three years. And then uh, I was, uh, you, many of you are coming from Bombay. You must have heard of Mr. Julio Ribeiro, a very, very uh, respected police officer who is now 96. He happened to select me for the National Police Academy. And the whole thing turned around for me. I went back to Hyderabad at the National Police Academy where I had been trained to train IPS officers. And today I proudly claim that uh, I trained five generations of IPS officers, five batches. And uh, most of the places where uh, I go today, even Karnataka or whether it is Delhi CP or Bombay CP, uh, everywhere my trainees are heading the police force, DGP and commissioner of police. So it was a matter of extreme satisfaction for me. Now, having pr when I went to the police academy, there was no looking back. After that, I did not have to beg for a posting. I did not have to plead with the DG that, sir, please post me, please post me. It was all different. People now knew that I know my job and I can deliver. So knowing your job and delivering is an important thing, whether you're in the government sector or you're in the private sector. Without that, I don't think anybody can rise up, whether it's a woman or a man. So then I come back, and uh, from there on, I have never looked back. I was posted to work as a DIG Patna. That was the time of Lalu Prasad Yadav, about whom I have written. And somebody asked me whether Bihar became the way it became because of Laluji. I don't think that was really true in the initial years when he had just come and I had just arrived back from Hyderabad. Then I went to the CRPF, that is the Central Reserve Police Force. Then I was with the CISF. I was with the Government of India continuously. The state of Jharkhand was created. I was recalled to Jharkhand to build up the state. That was another very, ex a, a very good experience to work in a state where we started putting all the files on the floor, spreading newspapers and putting files. And from there, when table and chairs were purchased, we picked up everything and came on the table. So that is the way we, we have uh, seen Jharkhand being built up. Finally, I retired as special DG in the CISF. And, uh, I heard Neha talk about uh, the, 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 the no ceiling and how you moved ahead and how you have, uh, uh, organ uh, how you have uh, branches in this uh, where uh, you restart your life. Uh, I have not really retired. I'm uh, still working, as uh, she has narrated. And about 12 years after my um, uh, retirement, I was persuaded to write my book. And I wrote this book only from memory. And uh, I <clears throat> have written up only about things which really affected me, and I feel that I should share with everybody else. So being, uh, having knowledge of your work, being passionate about whatever you do. And maybe I should uh, relate an incident. I don't want to talk too much because time is limited. I'll just talk about one incident, and I'll say that in the um, a government, we are bound by hierarchy and by rules. But sometimes, when you are on the right path, you can bend the rules and nobody will question it. And it may be also true for the organizations you all work with. You know, we had the 1984 Sikh riots. Mrs. Gandhi had just been assassinated. I was in a holiday in uh, um, Bombay as my sister was there and she was going abroad, so I went to meet her. 
and uh, when the day I was to leave, and a day before that, Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated. And uh, you know, those days we didn't have direct flights from one place to another. We had no flights from Bombay to Patna or from Bombay to Bokaro. So it took me two days to arrive and back to my state. And when I arrived, the whole city was in curfew. And uh, with two children, I'm uh, now arriving in a city which is in a curfew. In an uh, and an army jeep has come to fetch me to take me to my. Uh, uh, district and there was absolute chaos because uh, uh, there had been whole lot of massacres there people had the six had been looted killed uh, the DIG was holding charge for two days and uh, he had uh, sheltered everybody in a school so I was asked to take charge I mean I came back and there is uh, the entire force is looking for the SP because the SP is the pivot around which the whole police organization revolves. So I come back, I keep my children at home and immediately put on uniform, go there. Now in that, uh, I will just narrate one incident to prove that how passion uh, can help you establish many things. So there was this family where the husband and wife had been killed with leaving behind five children. The eldest was studying somewhere in Punjab and the youngest was only about two and a half years old. And people were tending to them and I did not know what to do. The first thing I did was to call that other girl from Punjab who was 18 years old, sent some force to be to Punjab to fetch the young girl back. So she came and then we visited that house and we realized that the house had been ransacked, the parents had been killed, there was blood everywhere. So when we started going through all, everything in the house, I found a key in a cupboard. In a steel cupboard which had been broken, there was a key. So I went, I uh, took this young girl and the key and I put, put her on my Jeep. In those days, we used to have open Jeeps. So in the Jeep, I'm going from one bank to the other. I thought it belonged to a bank. So Bank of India, Bank of uh, State Bank of India said no, Bank of India said no. And then there was a Punjab and National Sin Bank. They said, this key belongs to my bank. I said, can you trace who it belongs to? She so says, yes, I know it was Comrade Ajit Singh and his family, he was a businessman. It was his uh, locker key. So I said, can we open the locker? And you know, you cannot open a locker of anybody else. So I said, but look at this family, five children and they have nothing. And I also have no money to sort of look after their needs. And I've just put them with a very, um, with a family who was willing to keep the five children. So he took me to the basement and look at this uh, bank manager. He says, madam, if you take the responsibility and give it to me in writing, that if anything happens, you will take responsibility, I will open the locker for you. Now, in today's time, if uh, I would have never even thought that I can do something like that, but that time the blood was still young and, you know, you want to do things, you want to prove yourself, and who did I know that they will question me? I'm handling about a thousand people who have lost families, who have lost children, who have lost their home, how am I concerned what the government will see, say if I open the locker? So I said, Aapko jo likhna hai, likh ke de dije. So he wrote, I will take full responsibility if anybody questions the opening of this locker and I'm very bravely signing Manjri Jaruhar. We open the locker, we find pass, five passbooks, we find five licenses of trucks which belong to this man, a whole lot of jewelry. And this girl tells me, madam, this jewelry is for my marriage. I mean, in, even in this grief, she's so excited to see all that jewelry. And then 40,000 rupees in cash kept in an envelope. I took out everything, put it in her dupatta, said, bandho isko, and we closed the locker until date I have never heard about it. So it pays off. Sometimes you need to cross that line and take the thing. I don't want to go on and on, but a few things I do, do want to say that apart from knowledge, having passion about your work is important. Remember, you must have a role model and a mentor. Mr. Julio Ribeiro has been my mentor. He's 96, but I still con cons uh, consult him. He talks to me, guides me, because I never forgot that uh, incident when he selected me for the National Police Academy, which was another turning point in my life. He did not know me. He did not, uh, I had never ever met him. He asked for ACRs and in the ACRs, he found something about me which he, and that is why he selected me. People often ask me whether it is hard work or luck. 
because a luck, uh, which, whether it is hard work or luck, which takes your career forward. I don't believe that luck comes all by itself. It is only hard work, then luck smiles on you. This is what is my belief. If you work hard, people know about you, that you are a good worker, you will deliver. That is why uh, luck smiles on you. So passion, knowledge, train yourself, learn and relearn. I'm so glad that uh, Neha has started this uh, thing about restarting your career. Never stop. After my retirement, I'm working. I work with full force. I have not rested. It's been 12 years. So there is no need for people to feel that, oh, I've been uh, bringing up children. I've been any time you can start whatever you wish to do. Uh, remember that a woman has to play many parts in her life. It is not, I mean, it is a tough job. People often ask me, how did you manage a 24 by 7 job and also manage your family? I came from a very uh, <clears throat> large family. I had sisters, cousins, nephews, then my in-laws, everybody to manage. I think that uh, if we put our minds to it, you can do it. Another thing I would like to tell women today here is that reach out. Reach out to people to help you with your family issues. Don't always think that uh, you can manage everything, the children. You know, there were times when I'm feeding my children and the call comes for a murder or a dacoity. At that point of time, your children are not important. It is more important to reach the spot and save the situation and save the scene of crime for further investigation. At that time, you bank on neighbors, good neighbors, have a good help at home, look after the help properly, See that she's <clears throat> devoted to you. I've written a whole chapter about the help who stayed with me for 32 years. Very often, you know, we women have tend to have a nose up in the air. If you want to have a family and you want to do your job equally well, this is a very practical suggestion I'm giving it to you, that have good neighbors, cultivate wherever you are posted the people around you, have family help you, call your mother-in-law, call your mother, if you have to go for training. Often I was sent to training abroad. I had to bank on my parents or my in-laws to come and look after the children. Let us not have at that time nose up in the air that, okay, I am now an um, uh, uh, executive. I don't need anybody's help. You do need help. A woman has to play many parts in her life, but play the parts which gives you satisfaction. Play the part in which you thrive, where not just survive, but you thrive, you enjoy what you are doing. And that can be possible if you have a very good support system. I will, uh, about the four M's, marriage. Marriage is important. It should come at a time and you should be happy to embrace it. But if a relationship is not working, please don't think what will happen to you. If I could change my life, I'm sure you can change your life. In an abusive relationship, being a not uh, being humiliated every day. I've come across so many cases I can talk about where I've told the woman that don't you have any dignity? Get out of this. Get out of this because of the children. Are you shattering their lives? And they have made a life for themselves. So marriage, uh, take it in your stride. It is important, but uh, I'm sure you can make the best of it. Mobility. Transfer and postings do happen. Uh, you, it will happen for you also from one metro to another, you all will be moving. My husband is also an IPS officer, so that is more challenging because we can't have two SPs in a district. We cannot have two DIGs in a district. And in those days, when there was no mobile phone, no connectivity, STD had just been introduced, but you remember how STD was? You kept saying, hello, 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 but you never heard. So uh, there has to be an understanding that sometimes I will move, sometimes he would move. But of course, the children always moved with me. He could not take the responsibility of children. So that understanding you should have. There were yesterday, I uh, spoke Neha to some of the ladies, and it was very interesting. Two ladies who were with me said that they are pursuing a career, but their husbands are managing the home and the farms and everything else. I was so happy that uh, this has worked so well for them. So marriage, is, this is the way to handle it. Be uh, practical, be conscious of all the roles you can play. And then mobility, again, 
the transfer postings where you want to work is an understanding with the family, with your husband and your children. What is the best for you and what is the best for them? Then the next thing is motherhood. Motherhood should also happen. Why deny, why deny yourself that happiness? Don't keep postponing it. It is never the ideal time. The ideal time never comes to have a child. Whenever you think it is possible, that is your ideal time. And you should decide with your partner when to have the child. And then finally, menopause. I did not have any problem with menopause, but I do feel people having hot flushes and problems, depression, everything. But uh, now her key is there. You have a big uh, circle. You can share. You can uh, uh, you know, share and learn what you can do, yoga or some physical exercises. And there are so many ways to deal with it when menopause was not talked so frankly about the way it is being done now. It's all in the open. At newspapers, you'll see about vending machines, the latest uh, gadget to handle this problem. So <clears throat> this has to also come in the way. So finally, I want to uh, wish you all the best. It has really been a good experience for me. And the final few words I want to say is that in any career, practice humility. Be humble to everybody. For me, it was nice to be humble to the subordinate staff, to the public, and also with everybody else I interacted during the course of my career. Being humble helps you. Being in the police, we tend to be arrogant. We tend to do our own things. It's always good to listen to people. So be humble. Listen to your heart. It will always tell you what is the good thing for you, what is the correct thing for you. And I believe in the police, mental integrity is very often, very important. You would have seen police officers, you've seen films, you've seen so many things. But let me tell you that what they are showing you always is only for the 10% of the police force in the in country. The rest of the police force is holding the country together. They are holding Kashmir, they are holding the borders intact, that we can sleep well, whether it is in the Northeast or anywhere else. So hold, uh, uh, be in uh, touch with people, listen to your heart, have mental integrity. We all have the abilities to reach the top, but it takes uh, really all your, whim, all your strength to stay at the top. We can reach the top, but to stay at the top needs a lot of hard work. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my talk.